Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a new edition of the Daily Debate. In tonight's show we're going to be talking about the visit of the Slovenian President Borut Pahor to Egypt which is concluded today. We're also going to shed light on the visit of uh, Foreign Minister Semeh Shukri to the United States where he met a lot of US officials and in light of that we're going to be talking about the Egyptian foreign affairs. And joining us here in the studio to shed more light on this issue is Ambassador Hamdi Saleh, the former assistant foreign minister. We're also joined by engineer Samir Riyad, the economic expert and member of the Egyptian Industrial Federation. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our discussion, let's check out this report regarding the future of the Egyptian-Slovenian relations in light of the visit by the Slovenian president to Egypt and We'll be right back. President Abdel Fattah Hassisi received his Slovenian counterpart, President Baruch Pahor in Cairo, in the first official visit by Slovenian president to the country. During their encounter, the two leaders discussed ways to boost cooperation between both countries in various fields, in addition to important regional and international issues of mutual concern. Following their talks at the presidential palace, they held a joint press conference in which they stressed the significance of boosting bilateral relations and coordinating efforts regarding a number of regional and international affairs. President Pohor also met with the Prime Minister, Sheikh Ismail, and Parliament Speaker Ali Abdelail during his visit, which concluded on Tuesday. During his stay, he also attended a meeting of businessmen and representatives of 13 Slovenian companies taking part. During the two-day visit, the two states signed several memorandums of understanding on investment, environment, media and consumer protection. Slovenia's ambassador to Egypt, Tatia Miskova, has hailed as important the visit by the Slovenian president to Egypt. She believes the visit will help boost cooperation between Cairo and Slovenia. She reiterated both countries have always been on very good terms, adding that there are no political or historical barriers between Egypt and Slovenia. The ambassador noted that the volume of trade exchange between the two sides is on the rise and approaching pre-2011 levels. She described relations between both countries as excellent, as Egypt is the only African and Arab country which has an embassy open here. She said that after political circumstances in Egypt improved following the revolution, Slovenia elected a president and parliament and the constitution was modified which was the perfect timing for the Slovenian president to visit Egypt. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and starting off our debate tonight. Uh, now, Ambassador Saleh, Slovenia is a relatively small country in Europe, and uh, the visit by the Slovenian president to Egypt took a couple of days here and there were a lot of memorandums of understanding that were signed. What is the significance of strengthening the ties between Egypt and Slovenia? It's a very important element of the strategy of a medium-sized country like Egypt is to connect with countries who are searching for a role and who are searching for expanding their own contacts and so on. Not to focus only on the major powers and major countries, mm -hmm. but countries like Slovenia and Czechia and so on, countries who have already a, a new a vision to try to develop relations mm -hmm. with, the, with the outside world and particularly with, with the part of the world which they are not very, very much familiar with. It's, it, it should be one of the, our, our lines of uh, strategy mm -hmm. and I think this would be a good step in order to develop this relationship with Slovenia. However, the problem is that we have not really examined in the past what are the potentials for cooperation between such a country and ours. Probably most of the, the report talked about the fact that they have an export to an airport, which is amounts to a certain modest uh, figure. But this is a country which is uh, uh, developed, sophisticated, both on the economic side and on the cultural side. Mm -hmm. And I think we can expand very much the relations with them. Now, it, it really needs a coordinated effort from our side to work on what are the type of industries which Slovenia excels in to try to connect with it. Mm -hmm. and to try to expand the kind of partnership between the, the, our country and them. And second, to develop on our own uh, ideas about joint ventures. So not to talk about, you know, Slovenian investors coming, because basically this is not a country which is really sending a lot of investment, but uh, they can help in technology, not only technology which they have in their own country, but because they are a part of the Euro Europe as well. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, if you develop ideas about joint ventures, 
and develop also the process of how you get uh, financing for it from the World Bank, from the international organization, from, from the European Bank for Development and so on, then we are in, on track. This is the kind of strategy we should adopt, mm -hmm. to not only to look to these two major countries, no, but also medium and small countries like this, but second, to examine carefully what are you know, the, the points of strength of these countries and to see what, how we can develop relations with them. And third, not to talk about it in terms that we are waiting for you to come to invest. This is not the way. Mm -hmm. The idea is no, we are investing together. We are investing in, in joint projects, which might be part of it in Sylvania, part of it in Egypt. And the financing is available in, when yes. you have a, a, you know, what you call doable projects. Mm -hmm. Well, Engineer Riyad, do you feel that um, the presidency really made a lot of visits to many countries around the world trying to uh, sign a lot of memorandums of understandings. Uh, really, the country worked on a lot of economic conferences, at, attracting or at least inviting uh, businessmen from other countries to Egypt and sending Egyptian businessmen to other countries. However, the case with Slovenia, as Ambassador Sadeh said, maybe it's well-known country for strong investment and investors. Do you feel that it would be best to have some sort of a government-to-government -government economic agreement in, in terms of sharing the, uh, the know-how and the technology and the technicalities? And that way, maybe we'd, we would eliminate the, uh, the problems of the investment law and the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic problems that foreign investors uh, have when they come to Egypt. Well, as Ambassador Saleh mentioned, you know, we have to explode what can be done between both of those countries. Since this is a, a member of the European community, uh -huh. and definitely we can do something, you know, concerning the, our economy and so on. And our president, of course, he is trying to put us on the track that we are a major uh, country here in the Middle East and definitely we are very close to Europe and this is a big advantage which we should make the best out of it because mm -hmm. being very close to Europe it is a big advantage and let us see what we can do you know because our economy needs the support needs you know and our education needs the support and our training and the you know technical trainings needs support all of these things needs to be done, you know, in a very accurate and good way to enable mm -hmm. us to industrialize again our country and not to be all, only importer. We, ha we have to export our, mm -hmm. our goods and we have to have a strong industry in this country. Now, what sort of industries can the Slovenian uh, investors or the uh, Slovenian expertise help us in? Is it agriculture? Is it energy? Is it uh, infrastructure? How do you see it? I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, but definitely being a part of the, in the uh, it is a country in the middle of Europe and ex Czechoslovakia, it was mm -hmm. a very strong uh, industrial nation. Mm -hmm. And definitely they are very close to, to Germany and to Europe and they, were, they are very strong in, in industry because they are depending entirely on industry and definitely we have to mm -hmm. see what can be done between both of us. Yes. Well, Ambassador Saleh, now, when we talk about cooperation between Egypt and other countries such as China, such as Russia, such as India, um, sometimes we talk about how we're going to benefit from the cooperation with these countries and how are these countries going to benefit from uh, cooper uh, cooperating with Egypt. A lot of the times, other than the economic advantages that they could get, there's also some sort of a political support that they would uh, get from a major regional power such as Egypt. Do you feel that this is the same case with Slovenia? Would we offer some sort of a political uh, support to the country? Do they need a political support? Because it doesn't seem that they are quite involved with a lot of uh, political issues globally uh, taking place right now. I'm glad that in your question you give me a lead to answer. It's mm -hmm. a great, great idea that you, know, you give me a part of the answer which I will have to make. Let me emphasize at the, at the beginning that you know, our strategy to really to cooperate with other countries has not been going on the right track. Mm -hmm. the, the, the first minute you, you utter the word, we are looking for investment, then that's, not, that's a discouraging to the people. Mm -hmm. What you should do, and, is that, and I have been emphasizing that in the, in the, you know, a few minutes ago, 
is that you already, you, there is no problem with investment. There is no problem with financing. It is so much available worldwide. The issue is how to, to develop a spectrum of projects which are doable, which are financeable. And I think you, you present these, these projects to the, part, the right partners. So the, the, the strategy to develop relations with Sylvania, for example, is to set a committee, an Egyptian committee, to look into what are the points of strength of the industry in Sylvania, mm -hmm. what are the areas which could be you know, worked on, and to, to develop one or two or three joint ventures, and then to approach the Islamic Bank in Jeddah, the, Islamic, the World Bank, the European Bank for Development, for getting a finance, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So you are not asking them to come to invest. What you are asking them is to develop a partnership. And that usually a partnership is very strong case to get the financing. That's okay. the first point I want to mention. But the second point, as you said, there's a political dimension and there is a there is economic dimension. Now, Sylvania is a small country. It is in, in the middle of giants, France, uh -huh. Germany, and so on. So definitely it needs to have a certain status uh -huh. in the international system. And the fact that you know they will be approaching a country, a medium-sized country, which has a major role in the southern part of the Mediterranean, that gives them a, a particular status. Mm -hmm. So we can help them in building their own status in the European community and worldwide, and even in the United Nations. They can help us in really being a, our connection in the European, as the engineer has said, and the European community at large. Mm -hmm. As I said, the strategy in the past has been focusing on the major power and the, ma the, the big countries. That's not the, the right one. You know, you have to, co to co balance this, not, not to, not to mm -hmm. ignore it but to balance it with also looking into other spots which are really very useful to connect with and to develop relations with. Now, let me add to this the cultural damage mm -hmm. because, you know, Sylvania is part of a particular culture which is, a, a, you know, a combination of German and Russian and so on because it has been part of the, Ru of the Russian mm -hmm. the, the Soviet Union for a long time, the, the Eastern Bloc. So it has a combination of cultures which are really very favorable to us and I think we can develop some good relations in cultural level in terms of education, in terms of, uh, in terms of training and so on with them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, Engineer Riyad, uh, both of you mentioned the importance of really strengthening a uh, relationship with Slovenia, even though it's not the biggest country in Europe or the, uh, or the uh, strongest country in Europe. However, you've emphasized the importance of actually establishing a stronger relation with the European Union as a whole. Do you think that with... <clears throat> Uh, the Brexit and the, the recent resignation of the Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi. Do you feel that the European Union needs more allies as much... Well, they're not desperate for allies economically, but they would appreciate every uh, sort of agreement or strengthening of relations with other countries around the world now more than ever. Well, I would rather like my, our relationship to those countries, you know, that they give us the industrial know-how. Mm -hmm. They give us, the, you know, their training, their schools of, of, uh, of uh, what do you call it, the schools which they, uh, they can, we can benefit from the education system mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, you know, we need this support, we need to imitate how to build up a worker, how to build up an engineer, how to build up, you know, we are going to, you know, to, you know, to launch a lot of factories, a lot of industries, a lot of, you know, we need the support, we need the know-how of, you know, of education. You know? Uh -huh. We need to, to copy what they, how can they make out of their schools and uh, universities and so on, how to build a uh, a good manager, a good uh, worker, a middle management, all of this stuff, you know, we need the system. We, we are desperate for this system because we have to imitate. Get it. We cannot invent anymore. Uh -huh. We should see, you know, what is up to date now. They are very good in, in certain industries. Let us see how they are building the, the tools and the people and everything to enable them to be good in, in certain industries. This is how we should copy it from, the, from these people. Yes. Well, Mr. Ambassador, we've seen the presidency do a lot of visits, signing a lot of memorandums um, with many other countries. And each country, they say, well, this country is good at the uh, energy field so they can help us there, the infrastructure field so they can help us there, agriculture, 
and so on and so forth. However, with all these agreements and all these visits and all these promises of really trying to change everything here in Egypt from the smaller de detail to the biggest, when are we actually going to see some sort of uh, reform within the health sector or a reform within the educational system? How, when are we going to see actual strong steps <laughs> taking part in the system here in Egypt? Let me first comment on your first question that you, uh, you addressed to the engineer here. The idea that the European Union needs any kind of support. Mm -hmm. Europe does not need any kind of support. These are political trends which are a very natural process as a reaction to what was going on in the last five years. Mm -hmm. A tremendous wave of illegal immigration coming to Europe, tremendous of efforts you know, for, for people to really infiltrate the economic system and the political system and even do so. So as a result of that, there is this a typical, very natural reaction to have what you call the right wing coming back to the power, pushing forces in France, in Italy, and in, of course in Britain, mm -hmm. and maybe later on in other countries as well, Spain and so on. Now, we should not really be, you know, be bothered by this. Mm -hmm. This is an issue which is a historical process, and it will come later on to balance itself later on. Each country is searching for its own interest, and you know we, we can develop the relations with each country on its own, and we can develop relations also with the European Union at large. Mm -hmm. But we should not be concerned about the European Union that they are really needing a support. Mm -hmm. You know, if, yes. if somebody needs a support, it's not Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, let me move to the second point, which is, you know, you are, say, you are very much uh, correct. Mm -hmm. The president, this president, and the former president, and Hosni Mubarak, and the other president, have been going everywhere and really starting a process, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, signing agreements. Yes. The problem that, you know, the administration, the machine behind them, does not go ahead and really try to implement, implement these uh, the agreements. Mm -hmm. So the, the problem comes maybe 80% from our side, that you don't have the, the institutions which can really move ahead and find out what this agreement is about and how we can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been a problem in Egypt for a long time, not only in, um, in, in the, pro the major agreements which are signed by the president himself, but even you know, agreements, for example, signed by university to university by mm -hmm. a small institution and a small institution. Yes. You sign and then you forget about it. Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. It's about time that we can revise that approach and see to what extent we can really benefit from whatever you have. It's about time, and I'm calling now on the, on the Prime Minister's office and so on, to develop, to put together a committee to look into these, all these agreements in the past and to see which one we really can use, make use of it, mm -hmm. the best use of it. One part of the job of any ambassador when he goes to another country is to look into the, uh, the agreements which he had in, at hand and to try to maximize the benefit out of it. Yes. But, you know, we have so many agreements, as you said, but not, not all of it has has been, really, is, you know, used in order to implement and so on. Yes. Now, uh, we should not also rely on the others to change the country. Mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's really up to us to develop a process of development or a process of change and so on. And I think the president has made that clear several mm -hmm. times, that, you know, it's, all, it's up to the Egyptians themselves to really change themselves. Uh, he said that, you know, we are really in, in, in a difficult time because the, the government at large mm -hmm. is not really as effective. Yes. So it is about time to see, and we already started the, the economic reform, but, you know, it's also about time to see how we can develop a governmental re reform, not only administrative, but a governmental approach. Yes. Well, Engineer Riyadh, how do you feel, I mean, if we have a problem of implementation of these agreements or these ideas or these plans, the potential projects, and we have a problem following up, um, then who should solve it? I mean, if the government is not, and we've changed, the, we've reshuffled the cabinet quite a few times in the past uh, two years, now whose responsibility is it to change the administration, to change the system of following up on all these agreements? We have to, <coughs> to you know, mention the agreement, who is going to implement this agreement mm -hmm. and how it's going to be implemented. We have to go into the details of everything like uh, Mr. Ambassador said, you know. This is a very important issue. 
you know, to mention even the minute we sign the agreement, we have to give it to a committee to certain people, which is they have to identify who is going to implement it and mm -hmm. how it's going to not, be implemented. Not necessarily even governments. Maybe yeah, exactly. Private, 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 private anybody, mm -hmm. you know, providing that this can be put into action. There is a financial side of it, there is a technical side of it, there is too many things in it. This has to be sorted out. You mm -hmm. know, to sort it out and then you give everybody the job and then follow it up closely to enable you to get the benefit out of this agreement. Otherwise, mm -hmm. as I said, it is only a signing thing is not enough. Yes. Well, Ambassador Saleh, now Slovenia actually joined the European Union in 2004. <clears throat> Do you feel that the most important things, as you've mentioned that with all the presidency's visits globally, it's really about a, di a political dimension or re-establish some, some, some sort of a political role for Egypt. Do you feel that this is probably the main or the main subtext of all these visits and all these efforts, not just political support, not just economic trade, but also establishing Egypt as a, an, as a political powerhouse that has friends all over the globe? Look, Egypt is a medium-sized country. Mm -hmm. It's known worldwide what's Egypt about and what's not. Mm -hmm. Egypt has about maybe five or six million people who are graduates of university. It's respected for its own institution worldwide. I have been traveling the world all, all over, and I see mm -hmm. that you know, there is still an appreciation for Egypt. Uh, but also there is, there is knowledge about or information about the fact of the, the weaknesses of Egypt, you know, mm -hmm. the fact of that you have illiteracy, you have this, you have this, illiteracy, and so on. So what the president is trying to do at this particular point is that Egypt, during the revolution time, lost a lot of ground in terms of really the, stability, the, the, the perception of stability, the perception of what the country can, can offer, and so on, and what the is about, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the president visits, clarify these issues, re-establish Egypt as, you know, we are back in our position as a medium-sized country, and it's a ma major power in the region, the southern the Mediterranean, not only the Middle East, the southern mm -hmm. Mediterranean at large including Africa and so on. And by re-establishing that, you, you get a clout, and the clout affects the, the economic relations, the political relations, the cultural relations. Now, the issue is the president moves, he is carrying the flag, and he's opening the doors. What, what can come after that is, is the issue of the government, mm -hmm. the institution, not only the government itself, but also the entire society, the civil society, the private sector, the communities, and so on. We have to develop a dynamics which really moves ahead. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, in modern other countries, for example, it's actually the civil society and the private sector and so on who goes before the president comes, and mm -hmm. the president comes to conclude things. We have to develop a dynamics which can help this. We are not at this point, as, you know, point yet, but I think we are moving towards that. Yes, well, this raises an important point. Uh, now, Engineer Riyadh, being a member of the Egyptian Industrial Federation, do you feel that because we keep talking about what the government can do uh, for the investment here in Egypt, what the government can do to help the e Egyptian economy. But maybe the presidency and the government is trying to open doors. Do you feel that Egyptian investors and uh, in, uh, members of the Egyptian industry are actually monitoring all these moves and they're jumping on these opportunities? They know the Slovenian president is coming to Egypt. Do they jump on the, the opportunity to see what is the potential sort of cooperation they can have with such a country, not just Slovenia, with all the other countries before them? Do you feel that Egyptian investors and the private sector and industries are doing their part? Are they active enough? Well, really, you know, I cannot answer this question in, because definitely, you know, we have to find out what is the strength is in this society, what can be done. This is a part of the press mm -hmm. and, you know, to show and to get us, you know, the information in which part the Egyptian investors can involve, what can be involved, how can, you know, the, because all of us wants to, to, you know, to benefit from such visits. But, you know, let us open the door and highlight, you know, the, the you know, the important you know, of the, say, the industries, this and that in the Slovenia to enable us to, to go ahead and see our partners there, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, all sorts of things we need to, to, 
to support us, to enable us to move and to go ahead and benefit from that. Mm -hmm. This is uh, what I think, you know, but right now, I personally, I don't, you know, I know about Czechoslovakia, I know about this, but the present, every, you know, the, the world is changing every minute. Yes. And there is a lot of changes in this part of the world. And we want to know what is their strengths, what they are, what can they do for us and what can we do for them. Mm -hmm. How can we cooperate, you know, as a investors, as a partner, as a, as a buyer, as a seller, whatever, you know. Yes. Definitely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, definitely there is... Sure, go ahead, Mr. Ambassador. Yes, very, please. Very please point you made. If you look into the, the, the business community in this country, mm -hmm. you find that it's a very limited number of people who are really exposed internationally. And they are really being connected with through the American Chamber of Commerce, the French Chamber of Commerce, and so on. You don't have a mechanism, an institution, a unit, which really can expose the, the large... In a population of the, uh, the Egypt, what you call Egyptian Association of, of, of Commerce, or a very large number of business people, they don't have an, a way to connect with the, with the delegations coming from abroad or to understand what's going on about it and so on. Mm -hmm. I want to give, to give a particular example of what's happening in the United States. In each state, in Texas, in Florida, and whatever, there is an office called an Office for International Business, which mm -hmm. tries to help the business community in their own state, in their own you know, community, county, and so on, to connect with people who are coming from abroad. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. We, we should have that. We should have an institution which is expanding the horizon in front of the business community in this country here to see what is the international potentials mm -hmm. and to tell them what are the practices of the international business abroad and how we can, they can go about it. Mm -hmm. Not in the typical way of the Egyptian mentality where you are re really making a, you know, what you call a, a pound for a pound, a, a mm -hmm. dollar for a dollar. No, you have to have a, a more you know, long-term horizon mm -hmm. and to see how we can develop that and the government should be behind it. Yes. That. Well, definitely the Egyptian investors should share a certain vision for the economic future here in Egypt. And not only that, the Egyptian government has been working hard in establishing strong foreign relations. Quite recently, over the past few days, the foreign minister, Sameh Shukri, has been uh, to the U.S. meeting a lot of high-ranking officials. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. Minister of Foreign Affairs Sema Shukri said the goal of his visit to the United States is to follow up on bilateral relations and for initial communication with the administration of U.S. President-elect Donald Trump. He added that Trump's meeting with President Abdel Fattah Sisi in September demonstrated a common vision regarding several regional issues. He said it is obvious that the new U.S. administration will follow the same steps as Egypt regarding regional issues including terrorism. The minister noted that he discussed the U.S. military aid to Egypt with congressional committees as this aid needs to be increased due to the challenges Egypt is currently facing. During his visit, Shokri met with the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Paul Ryan, to give him an overview on the economic, social and political conditions in the country. The minister gave him an overview of the situation in Egypt and Shokri further explained the social and economic reforms undertaken by Egypt and their importance in restoring and restructuring the economy. For his part, Ryan requested to convey a message of support to Sisi from the Congress, adding that he's keen to visit Egypt to bolster the depth of bilateral relations. The visit also included meetings with Republican and Democrat leading figures, upcoming U.S. Vice President-elect Mike Pence, current U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, and several Congress members. Shokri delivered a speech at the forum organized by the Brookings Institute's Saban Center for Middle East Policy. In his speech, he discussed Egypt's foreign policy towards the ongoing problems in the Middle East. He added that Egypt supported systematic changes following the 2011 revolution that aimed to change decades-long unaccepted reality, stressing that these changes led to the integrity and stability of Egyptian institutions, unlike what happened in several other countries. The top diplomat also tackled the Syrian crisis, saying that Egypt's vision of a solution to the current turmoil in Syria lies on two main pillars. The first is to preserve national unity and territory integrity and to prevent the collapse of Syrian institutions. The second is to support the aspirations of the Syrian people to rebuild Syria through a political solution. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, focusing our discussion right now on uh, Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri's visit to the U.S. Now, Engineer Riyad, do you feel that this visit by uh, Foreign Minister Shukri, do you feel that...
this really um, sets the tone for the, uh, the Egyptian-U.S. relations under President-elect Donald Trump. Do you feel that this should be really dictate the, the sort of dynamics of a relationship between both countries? The timing of the visit mm -hmm. is an important issue, I believe, for the Egyptian foreign minister and foreign, you know, and the, for the future, we have to identify what kind of direction mm -hmm. is going to be, you know, and we have to, you know, to identify a lot of things because people are mm -hmm. going to change, maybe the strategy, and definitely our relation to the United States of America, it is an important issue, which we have to take it very serious and we have to not to put a foot wrong and mm -hmm. to identify what is going to happen during Mr. Trump's, you know, uh, time of, of ruling. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, I believe this is, a, it is a sort of a discovery uh, journey of what is going to, to be in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that is my view. I could be right and I could be wrong, but definitely it's an important visit to set a strategy for our relationship with the United States. Yes. Well, Mr. Ambassador, do you feel that it will be uh, some sort of a different relationship between both countries? Everyone was surprised when Donald Trump won. Everyone expected Hillary Clinton to, if she actually won, the relationship would still be more or less the same as it was under Barack Obama. Now, how do you imagine this relationship will be like uh, with uh, Donald Trump in office? Uh, first, let me emphasize two points. One is that, you know, America is really now going into a radical change, mm -hmm. both on the political level and the economic level. And it was unexpected because we did not examine America well. But, you know, 70 percent of the population, the white population, said that they have to have a reaction to the last eight years of Obama, and that's as a result of that you have Trump mm -hmm. you know, emphasizing the mm -hmm. American interest and American nationality and so on, and I think he will, have, he will have a different strategy both within the country and outside the country. That's the first point. So we, the, we are at a critical point. I think it's very important for us to re-examine our relations and to see how we can benefit from that situation. This situation gives you a golden opportunity mm -hmm. and gives you a serious challenge as well. So it's up to you as a country, as a medium-sized country, to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Second point, we have been allied with America for the last, for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. We did not develop a team of people who really can ex examine and study America well until now. And even the, some, the few people who really know America well, we are not using them in, in the right place. So as a result of that, you don't have a, a process to get into the hearts and the minds of America. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's about time to do that. It is not enough for the, for the foreign minister to go right away immediately. That's, that's, that's what's called a ceremonial visit, where you really connect, you see. But, you know, it's not enough. It's just an, you know, opening the doors. And I think what you need after that is to develop a mechanism to really connect with the new America, which mm -hmm. has been re really shaped after the, the last election and so on. Now, to come back to the, to the foreign minister's uh, Mr. Salma Shukri's visit, I think it came at the right time. I think he, he has been trying to connect with the new administration. Uh, but, you know, the issue is not only connecting now, because the connecting now, people now are too busy. You know, they are really looking into what, how they can reestablish themselves and so on. Mm -hmm. They are not ready to listen to, you know, what our outsiders have come to see to say and so on. But maybe it's just you connecting, getting familiar and really saying we are here. Mm -hmm. I think the turning point will be a month later after the integration, that President Trump, after he get, takes office, he will invite several presidents of countries to come to visit. And one of them, I, th I think, will be uh, President of Tahat Sisi. And that will be an opening for the new relationship. Mm -hmm. We have to be ready for that point of, of departure, where we can have a de we develop a strategy. A, with regard to the regional conflicts, like what Senator Shakri was talking about in his uh, speech. But B, with regard to the bilateral relations in terms of economic and culture and so on. And I think we have several uh, what you call common co causes between mm -hmm. us and the new administration. One of them, the major one, is really to defend civilization against the extremism and against you know, all this violence and terrorism and so on. Mm -hmm. this, is, this has been the, the, the articulated you know, goal of the administration of, of uh, President Fatah Sisi, and it is the articulated goal of the, of the administration of Trump. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a particular goal which we share together. Also, the, the orientation 
How, how can we approach this problem? We, in, in a sense, there is, there is a commonality between, uh, between the two administrations. We have to approach it not only politically, you know, militarily, but mm -hmm. also politically and culturally. So I think we can build on these things, but we need to develop now a strategy to move on. Not only just a, you know, a visit, one or two, but to develop a process. Yes, and we'll definitely be talking about that uh, later on as well. Now, Engineer Riyadh, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Shokri actually met with John McCain, who is the chairman of the House of Representatives Armed Service Committee. Do you feel that they might be discussing the uh, military aid that Egypt uh, receives annually from the US? Do you feel that we really need to? Uh, expand or develop this aid now that we already have a lot of military uh, relations with countries such as Russia, such as France, such as uh, China as well. And also, the US is trying to reinvent or reestablish itself economically in light of the threat, uh, the economic threat China poses. How do you feel this tackle, uh, this file will be tackled uh, between Egypt and the US? Well, if you want me to tell you the details of that meeting, I wasn't around there, you know, but... But how would you imagine it? I can imagine only one thing, that how Egypt going to be economically strong mm -hmm. to enable us to penetrate through everything and everybody will respect us and we're, our relationship to the United States and so on. Of course, we need support from the United States military or whatever it is, I'm not sure, but we are versifying the, 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 the buying, we are buying from several other countries as well, <coughs> but definitely United States is our major supply of, you know, of uh, uh, military equipment once mm -hmm. upon a time, and I am not sure if we need them to that extent now or not, but definitely the, the new, the future, Mm -hmm. You know, and to establish a good, few, you know, good relationship with the new, you know, with the new team and the new government of the United of the United States will be even important to us. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is why uh, the the people chose uh, a candidate who has more economic experience than political one? Definitely, this man is going. We it is a lot of question mark about Mr. Trump and Mr. and Trump's choices and so on. But definitely, the experts can see through what kind mm -hmm. of policies he's going to adopt. And definitely, we, we have got you know, good people here to read what is going to happen. You know, and you know, and they put the right strategy to enable us to benefit from it. Since he is, there is a lot of common between us as the Egyptians, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, directions and uh, policies and Mr. Trump's ideas. Yes. Uh, well, Mr. Ambassador, now, we've said before that a lot of people were surprised that Trump got elected. However, a lot of uh, Arab political observers and analysts were quite excited about that, much, uh, much more than they would have if Hillary Clinton actually won the elections, because they say he has a different strategy regarding the regional crises uh, that are taking place in Syria and Iraq. And uh, it's probably a more direct uh, approach in solving these crises that is shared by countries uh, like Russia, uh, countries uh, like Egypt as well. How do you see the new administration's strategy in dealing with these regional crises uh, surrounding Egypt? First, let me uh, comment on your point about the meeting uh, John McCain. Mm -hmm. John McCain is a very important senator, uh, a Republican. Mm -hmm. He represents a different of Republicans from uh, Trump. And I think it's a very good uh, point to meet with him. He's the chairman of the, the Armed Service Committee. Uh, the alliance between Egypt and the United States in, in exchanging uh, what you call military in, you know, hardware and so on is very important. And I think it will continue. The Egyptian army has been developed for a long time now on American technology and American weaponry and so on. I think it, could, it will be developing very fast. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there will be interruption to that. Diversification is useful. But in the final analysis, you have to really wrap up all these things together in creating a point of sense for the military uh, institution in this country. 
to move to the point about you know what what is the difference between Trump and and, uh, and Obama and Hillary mm -hmm. now I mean, the the Trump strategy now would be entirely different different from the, the Obama administration the Obama administration was basically saying well let us contain the conflicts let them fight each other in Syria let them fight each other in Yemen in, in Libya as long as they don't come to our borders or affect our interests that let them really continue their fighting so containing the conflicts is really a terrible prize for humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed in Syria and Yemen and in uh, Libya and everywhere, and there is no solution. The international community should really have a certain say in this, uh, especially that, you know, they were, you know, part of the, uh, the problem was b basically because of the interference of the mm -hmm. major powers, and one of them is the United States interference in, in Iraq and even uh, France and the U.S. in Libya, and, you know, the problems of, uh, you know, Iran interfering in, in Yemen. So mm -hmm. the problem is not really a regional problem. It has also elements of international interference. Now, Trump comes with a different strategy. Number one, what I understand is that he is looking up to building a traditional alliance between the United States and the major stable countries in the region, Egypt, Jordan, and the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And B, to try to contain the aggressive attitudes of Iran and to try to, to reset the situation with regard to the nuclear agreements and so on. C is to try to find out how can you contain the conflict of Syria. It should not really continue like this, either to stabilize it or to see and, and you know, some way of, of uh, solution. And that will be done, as, as far as I understand, in cooperation between Washington and Moscow, mm -hmm. between the Russians and the, Amer and the Americans. And D is to develop a certain kind of type of stability. The Trump administration is for economic development, for prosperity for America, and they see stability as part of really expanding the horizon in front of the American industry and, and the American you know, economy. And they don't see the, the benefit at all of these continuing you know, conflicts in the, in the region, which is really exporting to them so much trouble. So mm -hmm. I think he will come to stand on the side of stability and on the side of the people who are co combating you know, terrorism and extremism, which is basically have been advocated by Egypt in a very clear way. Yes. Well, Engineer Riyadh, talking about reinventing uh, America's economic prowess, now Egypt has developed a strong uh, relation with China recently. Now China is the biggest competitor economically to the United States, being the second biggest economy in the world. Do you feel that at any point this could really uh, create some sort of uh, a problem, even a minor one, uh, in dealing with the Egyptian-American relations, our strong relations economically with China, and definitely will be also offering a lot of political support to China. I, I believe in this century, once upon a time, it used to affect our relationship. But I don't think this is going to happen now with this uh, you know, the world today, look at America itself, what kind of relationship has got with China, mm -hmm. you know. And that is why we shouldn't look at it, you know, with uh, 50 years ago or 30 years ago. We have to look at it as a, as a present saying, you know, which I don't think this contradicts with anything, you know. Mm -hmm. it is a, everybody is looking after his interest. If there is any benefit for anyone, you know, he should grab it, you know, we shouldn't leave every, any door open to have, a, you know, we ha you know, actually, I've, I'm very proud of the way how we, our government and our president is trying to be, you know, to be friendly with every nation, to have connection with every nation and not restricted to any, any side, you know, mm -hmm. and this is a, is a good, is a good thing. I hope that this will benefit and will get the you know, the, the result out of it, you know, soon. Yes. Well, Ambassador Saleh, now Egypt has strong relations with Russia, strong relations uh, with China, uh, strong relations with the Gulf countries. Uh, the U.S. has up and down relations with many of these countries. Uh, somehow uh, we're talking about uh, another Cold War with Russia, and then they say, well, Donald Trump is on good uh, terms with uh, Russian President Putin. We see uh, up and down relations with Iran. They first uh, agreed on the nuclear disarmament treaty, and a couple of days ago they extended the, uh, the economic sanctions on Iran for the next 10 years. Now, how Egypt is really playing uh, a very good part trying to be on good terms with all of these countries. 
How long do you think we can sustain this uh, relationship? And do we at some point have to pick one side over another that would put us in a deadlock uh, or a confrontation with any of these countries? Look, uh, in the past uh, few weeks, we, I have seen several articles uh, appreciating the idea that Egypt is the only country probably in the region who has good relations with both Moscow and Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that, you know, Trump came with saying that, you know, Putin is a wise man and, you know, Putin said the same thing about him, that reveals that there, is, there would be certain understanding between Moscow and Washington about how dividing the game and how really you can really move in the regional conflicts and so on. And I think Egypt with its own relations, good relations with Moscow and Washington can be an effective partner in this. Mm -hmm. Now comes the issue of China. China was not a problem until two days ago. Mm -hmm. in, term, in terms of the tri trilateral relations. And then suddenly President Trump made or received the phone call from the President of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And then that created a tension between yes. the United States and China. Uh, definitely China will be, will be in a difficult time with Trump. Trump is going to, to have a different way of dealing with China. Now, let me say the, the, the main point about, you know, people say that you know, China is competing with America. That's not very true. I mean, America, China is competing with America only on a certain level of low and, and mid, middle level technology. But when it comes to high level technology, they are not there. America is really the leading power in the, in the sophisticated technology, in the most developed technology and so on. So as a result of that, there is no, not much really you know, fear from America that, uh, that China will retake or take over the, the, their market because their market is basically the most sophisticated technology, whereas the market of China is the low uh, technology, low level technology, what you call intensive labor and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, our relationship in this trilateral world, where you know Moscow, Pekin, and, and Washington will be the major powers in this, is, is very is very important to game. And I think the strategy should be really balance things off. We have we have in the past learned a game of balancing during the Nasser era, when Egypt was really playing the game of Washington versus Moscow and so on. And I think we need to develop a new strategy to see how we can balance these powers together and how we keep a good relation with the three of them. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as the engineer said, this is a different world. It's a world which people now appreciate the economic interests and, you know, the, and the political interests as well. Now, with regard to the, to the region in particular, there would be a different, different you know, well, you know, landscape in the region. The region now is in, in, a, in a bad shape. It's actually full of conflicts in Syria and Iraq and so on. Nobody knows exactly whether Syria will be united again or not, what will happen and so on, what will happen in Libya, what will happen in Iraq. So, there is tremendous, uh, you know, uh, conflicts over there, and I think the, the, the process for re-establishing re stability in the region needs a real uh, major effort from the regional powers, Egypt, the Gulf, and Jordan, and so on, in cooperation with the, with the international community, and also needs a new vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really calls for a certain rapprochement between Egypt and the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia, and develop that rapprochement in this critical time. If that doesn't happen, then things will go in a different way because America will make an alliance with Egypt, Jordan, and so on and develop its own relationship with, with Moscow and they re-establish stability. But I think, I hope we can have an Arab vision for the future of the region. Yes. Well, Engineer Riyadh now talking about really strengthening the economic relations with China. Last Thursday, uh, Egypt has launched the Egyptian Chinese Investment Businessman Forum which really works on strengthening, uh, practically strengthening the, the economic relation between Egypt and China. Do you feel that there are two scenarios? Other, it's, it, it could put Egypt in some, not a confrontation with the US, but some sort of um, we're n unfavorable uh, position between both countries in regards of us strengthening the economic relations. Now, the other scenario is that it will put Egypt in a good uh, position where China will be trying to work hard to win Egypt's favor. And at the same time, the U.S. would really try to uh, win Egypt's favor economically. Which scenario do you see? I'm in favor of the second one. You know, I mean, the Chinese-Egyptian relationship is needed. You know, actually, the, the Chinese, they are penetrating in Africa. Mm -hmm. And they are already there, you know. 
And let us uh, see what can be done, you know, the Chinese, what can they do for us? We have been importing a lot of goods and a lot of things, but definitely Egypt is an important country in the region, you know, uh -huh. which I politically and economically, our relationship to the Chinese, I don't, I don't know if, the, you know, you agree with me that the, why should we have a, a sort of disturbance with America if we yes. are, you know, have got an economic relationship with, with China. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is going to affect our relationship to America mm -hmm. to that extent, if I'm not mistaken. But definitely, if we can benefit from this relationship, let us go and have it. Yes, definitely. Mr. Ambassador, one final question because we're running out of time. Now, the relationship between the U.S. administration and Iran is a very interesting one because it's not just a, a two-way relationship. There's also the, the relationship with the Gulf countries that come into uh, this equation. Now, for many years, the U.S. and the Gulf countries were very uh, good allies because of the oil that uh, the Gulf countries can supply to the U.S. However, Iran has been trying to reestablish its, uh, itself as a, a regional power within the Middle East and North Africa. And the United States has sometimes on good terms with Iran, sometimes not. Uh, the, the whole issue of the Shiite Sunni conflicts taking place, whether in the Gulf, whether in other countries uh, around the region. How do you describe this relationship, the development of this relationship between these three parties? Will we see still the U.S. administration being a good supporter and a good ally for the Gulf states with Iran in the equation? Are they trying to win Iran, uh, Iran's favor over? They recently uh, extended the sanctions. So it's not such a great relationship right now. And Tehran responded saying, well, this extension does really violate the nuclear, treatment, uh, nuclear disarmament uh, agreement. How do you see this, the dynamics of this triangle? I'm glad you gave me all the elements of the answer. <laughs> right? anyway, let me mention here that uh, the, U the U.S. administration under of the Barack Obama was focused on containment and co-optation mm -hmm. to try to co-opt Iran. It, it, several voices, among them is myself, I wrote even in American uh, newspapers saying this is the cooptation and this time of appeasement is not correct. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, Iran is now is a very aggressive country which is moving in four Arab countries and it's moving also in the Gulf and it is really creating this split in the Sunni and Shia and so on, which was not there 40 years mm -hmm. ago. So uh, this is not the way to really handle the region. Now, the Trump administration is coming back to the original American policy. Mm -hmm. Not, not it just it was. This was deviation from American policy. American policy should not tolerate the aggressive attitude of Iran. Iran is even, you know, you know, trying to, you know, uh, make some attacks on on American fleets in the in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. It's it's very insulting for America, for a country, a small country, a medium sized country like Iran, to do all these these things which is provocative and insulting to the Americans. So I think the Ameri the new administration will take a very tough stand versus Iran. And already they started that, number one, because of Trump pronunciation, but number two, because of the appointment of the James uh, uh, Matisse, the, the new uh, Secretary of Defense, who's really already have written a book on how to deal with this Iranian aggressive attitude. So I think there would be a different attitude with Iran, not in calculation here in the Gulf. It is mm -hmm. basically the American way of handling a medium-sized power who is really becoming so aggressive and trying to expand beyond its borders too much, overextending itself. Not, all, not only overextending itself in terms of being radiating power, but in terms of using the small conflicts and the sectarian conflicts and so on, which creating trouble and you, you know, fomenting even uh, terror, uh, terrorism and so on. So I think there would be a, a tough stand versus mm -hmm. Iran. The Obama administration even started that, the, as you said, the, already the Congress now, and you know, just uh, you know, voted for the sanctions. But there will be a more a tougher stand now. It's about time that the Gulf states, and now they are meeting in Bahrain, to develop also a strategy to see what this, at this critical time, when the U.S. administration is changing, and the, and the Moscow also changing its own policy, mm -hmm. and the region is really changing, to develop a new strategy, a new vision, how they can deal with this. Yes. Because it, it's gone are the days of the, of the oil, where oil it was a major issue for the West. Now it's not. Mm -hmm. It's actually a strategic you know, yes. problem. Yes. So I think 
there is a need for a new vision and new strategy. Yes, definitely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Egyptian uh, foreign affairs file is very uh, is a very busy one and a very active one for the past few years, and still definitely will be will prove to be uh, much busier in the near. Future. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Debate. But before we go, I'd like to thank our very distinguished guest, Engineer Samir Riyad, the member of the, engineer, uh, of the uh, Industrial Egyptian Federation. I'd also like to thank uh, very much Ambassador Hamdi Salah, the former Assistant Foreign Minister. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned for more coming up on Nile International. I'm Hany Saif. Thank you for joining us.